Um, so next presentation is from University of Oklahoma. Dr. Jeffrey Walls is going to talk uh, on uh, innovative multi-hazard resistant bridge column for ABC. Dr. Walls. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you, everybody, for your time. Um, today, I'm going to give you an update on our ABC UTC project, Innovative Multi-Hazard Resistant Bridge Columns for Accelerated Bridge Construction. My name is Jeff Foltz. I'm the PI on the project. My co-PI is Royce Floyd, also from the University of Oklahoma. We have two graduate students working on the project, Jackson Milner and Omar Yadek, and we have an undergraduate student working on the project as well, Courtney Dawson. This project has a companion project with the Oklahoma Department of Transportation, where we are using the two projects together to generate much more data uh, for our full-scale testing. So I want to thank the ABC UTC for providing the funding and helping us with our research. What I'm going to talk about uh, briefly is some background and the rationale for our study, why we're doing what we did and also the goals, objectives, and tasks, as well as the work completed to date, and then I will be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Numerous techniques uh, exist for accelerated bridge construction of bridge superstructures, but very limited techniques exist for accelerated construction of bridge substructures, which is the focus of our current study. The study examines not only a method that will hopefully accelerate bridge substructure construction, but also result in a column that is much more resistant to multiple hazards, both natural and man-made. Traditional pier columns are constructed from reinforced concrete, typically cast in place, which requires formwork, whether they're square, rectangular, or circular, and also requires the fabrication assembly and installation of a reinforcing cage. Many researchers have investigated alternatives to these types of pier columns to accelerate bridge construction and also re result in a more durable and stronger column. These alternatives include concrete filled steel tubes where a steel tube is used on the outside of the column which serves as a stay in place form eliminating the need for the installation of formwork and removal of formwork. It also provides confinement to the concrete that's poured on the inside, increasing its apparent strength, and replaces the reinforcing cage, reducing the labor costs and the time costs on site. Tests of these types of columns have shown them to have very high capabilities in terms of axial loads and lateral loads, as well as enhanced ductility with the steel tube and the concrete acting together. One of the downsides of concrete-filled steel tubes is that we're now placing the steel on the outside of the columns, which means it's now susceptible or more susceptible to corrosion, and it has to be protected during construction, when construction is complete, and often requires more maintenance than a reinforced concrete column might require. An alternative to the steel tubes, researchers have investigated the use of fiber-reinforced polymer tubes to replace the steel tubes and eliminating those corrosion concerns. The FRTP tubes also provide confinement of the concrete as well as acting as a stay in place form. But tests have shown that they don't have as much ductility, which can be a critical issue, particularly in seismic regions. And they're not as ductile in terms of unforeseen hazards like overloads and vehicle impact. Researchers have also examined the fact that a solid concrete column is not as efficient in terms of using the materials. So a more efficient column would have a hollow core, whether it's square or rectangular or round. Research has also shown, though, that a single layer of longitudinal steel does not result in a column that has very good ductility. And you have to use two layers of reinforcing steel tied together with cross ties. So although it is more efficient use of the concrete and ultimately the steel, there are still the high labor costs of fabricating, putting the steel cage together, 
and installing it in place as well as also with a hollow concrete core, not only do you need formwork on the outside, but now you need formwork on the inside to form the shape. Some researchers and, and transportation engineers have looked at precast options for hollow core concrete columns. There are some issues with regard to the weights and the installation uh, and splicing together, splicing them together can have some problems. Although there are options with pre-stressing or post-tensioning the precast columns. Our research is based on taking all of the positive attributes of these alternatives to the traditional reinforced concrete column, but eliminating, hopefully, many of the downsides. So our column starts with an inner steel tube, an outer FRP tube, and then a concrete core, which for our research will be fabricated with either high strength self-consolidating concrete or ultra high performance concrete. The inner and outer tubes provide stay in place forms, eliminating the need for formwork and the time and cost associated with that. The inner and outer tubes also provide confinement to the concrete core, increasing its apparent strength. The steel tube provides flexural and shear reinforcement for the column, and the FRP tube provides some shear reinforcement, but because it's not bonded directly to the concrete, primarily just acts to protect the concrete core and the steel from corrosion and confine the concrete when it's placed under compression. We're examining both high strength self-consolidating concrete for the concrete core and ultra high performance concrete for the concrete core. Both of those materials flow under their own weight with no need for vibration, which reduces the number of workers required to place the concrete. And because both of those are higher strength than traditional concrete, could possibly reduce the required thickness for the concrete core. In particular, ultra high performance concrete with strengths upwards of 22,000 PSI and increased durability will hopefully allow us to make that concrete core as thin as possible. The real benefit in terms of accelerating construction is you bring the steel tube out to the job site, you embed it in the foundation, then you bring the FRP tube to the job site, place it over the steel tube, and then cast the SCC or UHPC concrete, and you're done. No formwork required, no internal steel cage required to be fabricated and tied, no formwork needing to be placed. So we definitely have an option of increasing the speed of construction, which is ultimately what we want for both worker safety and to reduce costs and disruption to the traveling public, but we're investigating whether we can also end up with a more efficient and more durable column. In terms of the goals and objectives and tasks for our project, the overarching goal is to achieve a accelerated construction method for bridge columns in what we call a hollow core FRP concrete steel column and use that in construction throughout the United States. In terms of objectives necessarily to achieve that goal, we're gonna determine the benefits of using high strength self-consolidating concrete or ultra high performance concrete, develop design procedures and guidelines for the design of these columns so that DOT engineers and transportation engineers can design them. To attain those goals and objectives, we have five tasks. The first task, task is to design and construct half-scale hollow core FRP concrete steel columns and one or two circular solid reinforced concrete columns that will serve as control specimens. And then we will test these columns under a constant axial load and varying increasing cyclic load until failure. We'll also perform a finite element parametric study so that we can vary more variables, investigate more variables because full scale testing can be very expensive. So we'll calibrate our finite element models and then vary the thickness of the steel tube and the concrete thickness and the FRP tube to study different ways to help us ultimately arrive at task four, which is develop design procedures so that engineers can calculate the required thicknesses of the FRP and steel tubes and the concrete. We'll then document and disseminate our results through our report to the ABC UTC, as well as these research days, and also submit 
uh, journal articles and give conference presentations on this research. In terms of the work completed to date, one of the benefits of the ABC project is we had already started on our ODOT project. And so we have some work that actually has been completed already. And I'd like to talk about that. Because we have a strong floor and not a strong wall, we can't test our columns upright in the lab. So we have to lay them on their side to test them. So we had, design, had to design and fabricate a test frame to attach to our strong floor to test the column. So we designed that test frame and we are in the process of fabricating the test frame. Because of the pandemic, uh, we could not find a steel detailer that would help us with the detailing in, in time frame that we needed. So we're doing a lot of the detailing ourselves. Thankfully, we have a certified welder that is our lab manager and uh, a number of very ambitious uh, graduate students, which is always good. And so we have been able to fabricate most of the test frame. On the right, you'll see a picture of the completed base of the test frame where the columns will be attached to, and it's currently anchored to the strong floor. We have actually fabricated four of the bases and the embedded steel tubes for four of our columns. Two of these will be high strength SCC, and two of them will be the ultra high performance concrete. We are currently instrumenting, uh, or developing an instrument, instrumentation plan and starting to instrument the columns, both the uh, strain gauges on the steel in our steel tube. We'll put strain gauges on the FRP tube on the outside, load cells to measure the load and displacements and, and, and any tilt to the columns while they're testing. So once we have all the instrumentation involved, we will place these FRP tubes over the steel tubes and then cast the self-consolidating concrete or the ultra high performance concrete. Once we've done that and it has cured sufficiently, we'll lay the columns down, locate them on the strong floor and then cast the loading stub so that we can apply load to the columns gradually with increasing deformation over time cyclically until we reach failure. We've also fabricated the reinforcement cage and the base for our conventional circular reinforced concrete column. And we're actually have plans to pour that this afternoon. We got the notice from our concrete supplier that they would be able to fit us in, fit us in, and we'll be pouring the base for our control column later this afternoon. So again, this system we hope will have enhanced ductility and enhanced strength but most importantly, also be a way to accelerate construction of a bridge substructure, which we think definitely can help in terms of accelerating the entire construction process. In terms of work moving forward, we'll continue to fabricate more of the specimens between the ODOT project and the ABC UTC project. We'll be able to investigate more variables in terms of the full scale testing and be able to have a better handle on developing our design guides in terms of designing these columns. That's all I have for today, and I am happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Dr. Woltz. Uh, uh, so one question that, uh, uh, I have one more question on myself, so I, okay. I will uh, give myself uh, um, the advantage and ask that. Uh, um, so you are putting a steel pipe inside with um, empty space in there. So any thoughts on whether corrosion would be an issue for that? And if it is, again, I'm looking at my point of view of inspection, how would we know that it's uh, corroded? You, you just asked the exact same question that our um, liaison with ODOT asked not 24 hours ago when we submitted our, our progress report for the past month. Um, because you're right, it, it's, you have a steel tube on the inside, which on the concrete side will be able to be protected by the concrete, but on the inside, it's basically have a hollow space. And you know, we talked about the fact that once you put the pier cap on the top, You've, you've got a sealed environment, which will cut down on the 
tendency for corrosion to occur. There will be some moisture in the air, but you won't have it exposed to rain. Um, but we, we, we also, as you said, it's, it's nearly impossible to inspect and absolutely impossible to repair should you have a problem in the future. So we're, we're looking at doing some small corrosion studies in an enclosed space and to see whether or not we need to apply at least a primer coat on the inside for the portion that will not be cast into either the foundation or the pier cap to give it some resistance for what some mild corrosion that may occur. Certainly during construction, if it's sitting out there open at the top for too long, it's going to get water inside even and it will, will likely begin corrosion. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's a, an excellent question. No, and, and I'm glad I'm glad that it has come also from other places. But one thing for your information, we we can talk about it uh, outside. But we are doing a project similar, not in the same scale, but similar for if not uh, for a, a closed space uh, inside a pipe. So we can maybe communicate later. Uh, that's also with uh, Dr. Lau's help. Uh, so we can communicate later on uh, on the results, uh, perhaps. Uh, that would be wonderful. I, I would very much like to do that because it is a very it's it's an unusual situation because it's a confined space, so there will be air oxygen at least a limited amount over time, and, and you yes. do have some moisture, but you don't have constant moisture, and and then you worry about the fact that it's got the concrete on the outside, and you always worry about developing that. Uh, you know, sort of, sort of essentially like a halo effect that you do when you do concrete repairs because the exactly. alkalinity yes. is different. So are you actually going to make it worse on the inside because of the concrete yes. on the outside? So it is definitely something that needs to be investigated so that we all feel comfortable with it because once you seal it up, you're right, you can't inspect it very easily without drilling yes. through it. Uh, so excellent. That That's great. You also pointed out to another question, which we won't uh, go through it uh, because we have plenty of more other questions. Uh, the, the similar material, which you uh, also hinted that you are going to look into uh, concrete one side and the other and FRP and stuff like yeah. that, because again, corrosion is somehow uh, very sensitive to dissimilar material. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. but, uh, um, a, a similar topic, uh, again, as of durability, is asking that, uh, what about the fire hazard uh, on the FRP? Yeah, that is one, because I, I know we've done some research on FRP decks, and you know, you always have the issue that fire is, you know, FRP is much more susceptible to fire um, in terms of when you get to the right temperature, it obviously doesn't necessarily burn, but it volatilizes and you lose, if you lose the, the, the glue that holds the fibers together. Um, so that is, that is definitely a concern. I know that when, with FRP decks, some people have been looking at um, putting some types of coatings on them to protect the FRP and reduce its, its susceptibility to fire. It, it's hard to eliminate completely. But yeah, it's it's most likely one of the reasons that I know it's one of the reasons that FRP decks have, have, are not as prevalent as they could be because that is one concern if you have a either a, a vehicle, uh, particularly a truck that's underneath the bridge and catches on fire, you have that fire to it, or one that hey, you have an oil spill and a fire on top of the deck, you have that problem. So it is, yeah, the, the exposure of the FRP to high temperatures is an issue and and certainly were there were the yeah, it's it's a um, it's interesting that uh, we can talk like this and connect uh, different projects to each, uh, together. Uh, we have another project with FHWA on the FRP that again we can <laughs> we can hopefully <laughs> communicate on that on the fire and other uh, damage issues on the FRP. There is a way around it, or at least to help it. Uh, no, you're so, right. This is this is a wonderful venue to make those connections. That's yes, really yes. two two very pertinent connections right there with the corrosion and the FRP and fire. Yes. Uh, perfect. So uh, again, there's uh, more questions or so, but uh, we we are trying to keep up with uh, with our schedule. Thank you very much, Jeff, for a nice presentation. Uh, as you can see, it, the the topic has to be very good to uh, provoke 
questions and things like that. So it, it is really nice having a, a project like that. Uh, thank you.